I think it was a 1970 PGA Correct. tournament in Dayton, Ohio. Um, to what extent did you actually legitimately fear for your life? Well, I feared for my life for two years, uh, living under the apartheid government, which I didn't invent. In fact, I broke apartheid in sport, which most people in my country don't even know about. I've never done an interview about this. I'll come back to that in a minute with Dayton. I go to my prime minister at that time, John Foster, who was a great believer in apartheid. I said, Mr. Foster, I want to break apartheid in sport. That's, I'm a sportsman, I'm not a politician. I'd like, and he said, what would you like to do? And he had these big eyebrows. And I said, I'd like to invite a black golfer from America to come and play in our PGA, which is one of our majors. He looked at me like that, it seemed like a minute. And he said, go ahead. I said, because I, I really want to get rid of this apartheid in sport. And he said, go ahead. And Lee Elder came out, did a marvelous job. Now, presidents of America have given awards for sports uh, awareness. But here's a man who did way more than any athlete ever did. As far as the recognition is concerned, he helped break apartheid, help people from suffering like Lee Elder. dogs. Lee Elder. For athletics, for their athletic prowess, they were given medals. But no president ever gave him a medal. It took a lot of guts for Lee Elder. He could have, let me tell you, he could have been shot. This was this apartheid feeling. Just as you had apartheid in America, and Charlie Sifford and others weren't allowed to play. When I played here, they were not allowed to play on the tour. They weren't allowed to play on the tour, man, damn it. And I'll never forget playing with Charlie Sifford at, at Greensboro. I was walking up the, the, the par four before the, the par five, and I saw this guy kick Charlie Sifford's ball in the rough. And I called the PGA and I said, I saw this guy kick the ball in there. He was able to replace it. On the par three, there was uh, mutterings, go home, nigga, we don't want you here. And man, I stood up for him. And he took his pencil and thumped it on the table. He said, how do you play with this going on? I said, Charlie, I understand. I'm from South Africa. I understand what you're going through. So now I've won nine major championships in the, in the, in the record book. But in my mind, I know I've won 10. Because I'm playing in the tournament and I'd get to the top of my backswing and somebody would throw a book in my back, telephone book. Then I'd get on the green. This happened in the tournament. Get on the green, they just ready to put, and they'd throw two balls between my legs. Now, when you're wanting to win a major championship, think about this. It's hard to comprehend. And then on the ninth hole, I had a putt this long, 15 inches. And these guys were standing on the edge of the green, which they were allowed to do close in those days. And they all simultaneously shouted, miss, as I brought the putter down. I missed the hole by that much. And then I got to the 10th hole, and I was playing with Jack Nicholas, and these guys charged out of the mounds onto the green, and the police were grabbing them. And the guys skidded like it and tore up the green. And, this, and then I got to the 10th hole, and they threw ice in my eyes. This is how I had to play. And I lost, I think, by one or two shots to Raymond Floyd. Young guys playing the tour don't even know about that. How would you explain uh, the, the criticism and, you know, the kind of the vitriol that was directed your way then? Well, you, you, you incline. You, the one thing I'd learned by that time, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself. But it, it is sad for a person. When I was in South Africa, I, I broke the apartheid in sport. I sponsored at least seven black golfers, sponsored many of the black golfers to play overseas, got tournaments for them in those days. They weren't allowed to play in a white tournament. And I went to my business friends and we got 100,000. We sponsored three tournaments. But whatever you did, was never enough. Mm -hmm. According to certain black militants in South Africa, Gary Player didn't do enough. He should have stopped playing, which I was not prepared to do. I was not prepared to stop my livelihood, but I knew that I did an awful lot. And obviously you did a, a tremendous amount, but in fairness to some of the people that criticized you, um, early on, your views changed over the years as well, because I, I think in, I think it was like your first book or yes, one of your early yes. books, you wrote, you were a believer of the apartheid system of government then and, you know, the separation uh, of races. So wh wh why do you think you believe that well, then, early Muhammad on? Well, because Muhammad Ali in America was saying, we must live, the blacks must live in different states. 
And our government was saying to us, it was very similar to Germany. We were brainwashed to a great extent. And we were told by our government, this will be, now I'm a young man, I haven't had a world experience, that this will be separate but equal. So I thought, well, you know, if it's going to be separate but equal, that's not so bad. They'll have the equal that we have. There'll be no real problem. But it wasn't so. They were pulling the wool over our eyes. So we were brainwashed. And then I also said something about the number of people playing golf. Well, there were, there were any of those. When I was a young man at this age, I doubt if we had 10 million people in South Africa. I don't know what the number was. And no blacks played golf anyway. It was only whites anyway. So it was a complete different circumstance altogether. So well, it, was, it was really amazing how a government, how a government could brainwash. You can understand what happened in Germany. After I grew up and traveled and saw what was happening, and you know, I came to America, there was apartheid here. So I didn't learn much here, but I learned a lot going to England. It was a very civilized society. They didn't have anything like that. So I was traveling in a lot of places that didn't have it, and I learned an awful lot. And then you sit back and you say, wow, what did Germany do? How did they brainwash a nation? It's incredible. What led to you uh, making the decision to, you know, speak out against the system it's of government? It's very simple, because when you have the education mm -hmm. and you're not a young man that doesn't know anything, right. and then you leave South Africa and you're not insular, and you're not being brainwashed, you can form your own opinion.